This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. To learn more or to subscribe, visit beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. It's episode 347 of the Craft Beer Brewing Podcast. I'm Jamie Bogner, and we're in Phoenix, Arizona again for this episode. And joining me is uh, Preston Taney from Ren House Brewing. Welcome to the podcast, Preston. Thanks for having me. Ren House, uh, over the years, has, uh, has uh, you know appeared in Craft Beer Brewing Magazine. We did a breakout brewer a few years ago uh, along with... Uh, actually, I think that was built on the occasion of you guys winning a gold medal in the Hazy Juicy IPA category. Uh, for your beer Spellbinder, which uh, of course you were very kind in sharing a homebrew scaled recipe for that uh, to go along with the story years ago. Thank you. And if you were a craft beer brewing subscriber, go back into our archives and uh, and check that out. Um, that recipe for Spellbinder, gold medal winning beer. Um, you know. Uh, we are in competition season now as brewers are prepping for World Beer Cup, and they still will be by the time this episode comes out in about two weeks from now. Uh, in fact, we'll be getting down to like you know, closer and closer to crunch time, uh, finishing up those World Beer Cup beers in order to get them uh, you know, to judging in time. Uh, and it's something that you all pay attention to. Uh, I think through the course of this episode, we're going to talk uh, about finding ways to, you know, brew for that kind of excellence, uh, brew a broad range of beers. This is something interesting that you all are doing. Of course, you've opened up a location uh, in the south side of Phoenix that's a more of a beer hall uh, with a European lager focus, and you're brewing beers for those. Um, of course, you brew these core hazy IPAs uh, and West Coast style IPAs that uh, that keep all the craft fans in here. Um, but uh, as we were talking before the podcast, you mentioned you're also stretching out into English style ales right now, uh, just for the fun of it. And anyway, we're going to talk about building a creative program to brew a broad range of beers across styles and try to tap into what that process looks like, how you make those aesthetic decisions and then those technical decisions that come along with it, ingredient decisions and everything else. Um, yeah, and we're going to talk about how you build a point of view, especially in that hazy IPA category uh, um, that people respect you for. We're going to talk about all those things. Before we do that, at G&D Chillers, they always strive to build great chillers. Partner with them as you build great beer. But don't take it from me. Hey, this is Josh Erickson of Jafuncta Brewing in Mandeville, Louisiana. The team at G&D were a critical part of our 10x expansion, always just a phone call or email away. And thanks to their superior equipment, technology, and documentation, commissioning our new chiller was smooth and straightforward. Now we can't wait until we need to upgrade our existing chiller. That's right. Choose G&D Chillers on your next expansion or brewery startup and receive one free year of remote control and monitoring of your new G&D Chiller. And Turnkey Brewery Systems, production line design services, retrofitting processing systems, ProBrew can do all of this and more with any brewery, old or new, small or large. With an expansive list of breweries already served, their engineering team prides itself on providing a true turnkey solution built for your entire production line that can be easily customized to fit your operation. For more information, fill out their contact form at www.probrew.com or email contact us at probrew.com to learn exactly how they can take your operations to the next level. Probrew, brew your beer. Also, are you struggling to source affordable citrus ingredients due to market fluctuations? Try Old Orchard's flavored craft juice concentrate blends, which mimic straight concentrates at a better price point and with a more reliable supply. Old Orchard's citrus-flavored blends include blood, orange, grapefruit, lemonade, lime, and tangerine. To learn more and request your free samples, head on over to oldorchard.com slash brewer. All right, Preston. We normally start off with a little bit of background and history. What got you into beer? Um, what set you down this road uh, towards brewing? And uh, and then how did uh, Renhouse figure into this whole history of yours? You know, it's... I don't have a great background story. A lot, uh -oh. of, a lot of brewers right. do. Um, I was homebrewing in my garage. Yeah. And uh, it, it's not even that good. It, it was, I, I had a friend I worked with um, and him and I uh, were talking about, you know, the future. This is in college. And, and he had actually recommended, he had been homebrewing for some time. And he said, you know, you have a propensity towards science and you like being creative. Why don't you try homebrewing with me? So we did that. Um, to some success, um, it it probably would be laughable now, but at the time we were pretty happy with ourselves, you know. I mean, college, homebrewing in college, that's great. Yeah, 
Yeah, it was great. Um, and, uh, and then I did much less productive things. <laughs> in college. I mean, I did productive things too. Well, this yeah. was like my fifth or sixth year of college. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, no. So, uh, in college, I just made my ska zine. I was at a school newspaper, but I mean, I did other things like media related, which worked out for me, yeah. but for a good 15 or 20 years, it didn't look like it was going to work out quite <laughs> as well as it has ultimately worked out. I, I, I media think... seemed like a really dodgy choice there for a while. Right. Oh, totally. But look at you now. Hey, <laughs> we are what we make of it, right? Yeah, exactly. No. So, you know, something similar to that. It was, it was kind of a pastime and I wanted to, uh, I'd lived in Montana for uh, a year prior to that, and I wanted to move back up there. So I thought getting into a brewery would be a good, um, you know, lateral step for me out of college. Um, so I went back up to Missoula and just started knocking on doors. I was working at a like resort fly fishing ranch, um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to hear back from Big Sky Brewing in Missoula, which is where I was hoping to live anyhow, um, and they were looking for a brewer. I anticipated working my way up through uh, packaging like everyone else, but right place, right time. They needed a brewer and they were willing to train me from day one and uh, stuck it out there um, and uh, brewed there for a couple of years and uh, drew uh, Poole, one of the uh, other founders here. And uh, his wife and I grew up together, went to school together, uh, middle school, high school, college. And him and uh, a guy unbeknownst to me at the time, Bill Hammond, were looking at opening a brewery here and just needed someone on the production side. And so they reached out and, and uh, I was happy to move back to Phoenix where I'm from. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the origin story of how they, they brought me into it. They were interested from a creativity and business perspective and, and needed the uh, final piece to the puzzle and fortunate enough uh, that they chose me. So... Well, getting a, a brewing training at Big Sky is not the worst thing in the world either. That's, uh, yeah. that's, yeah. I loved it. I mean, you know, I loved the culture there, the people there, that the product was really good. Um, Moostrel. Moostrel was awesome. You know, we brewed it. We brewed 24 hours, five days a week. And, it, you know, Thursdays when you start brewing something other than, than <laughs> Moostrel. Um, <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the quality and consistency that they uh, instilled in us um, as my first job, you know, I think was formative. Um, for the expectations when I was fortunate to have my own production team um, to instill that same, you know, quality control batch after batch. Sure, sure. And then, yeah, un unlike some smaller brewery startups, you were right into the thick of production as your first job in yeah. the brewing world. That's, uh, that's intense. Yeah, no, it was, it was wild. Um, and uh, I think I probably hold a record for uh, longest training period and they thought i'd pick it up real quick and i had no idea what i was doing but by the end of it everything was good worked out okay <laughs> sure sure so you jump on board uh you know with this new startup brewery ren house you know when, what year was this so they probably reached out in 2014 okay. um and uh you know had some some great ideas and um you know conceptually it was Phoenix was an underrepresented market at the time. Sure. There were very few breweries. Um, there were some great breweries, but a lot of them were in, you know, Chandler, Gilbert, Scottsdale, some of the surrounding areas. And Phoenix proper had very little um, brewing going on at the time. And still feels like the entire state of Arizona, while great brewers here, still might be a little bit under, you know. Yeah underreached and you know that's sort of not 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 to give anyone any ideas but obviously it's created opportunities for for you all to open multiple locations yeah other breweries are doing the same like uh you know even arizona wilderness is now a multiple you know 12 west has multiple like you know it is more of a common you know to meet the demand here good breweries are able to expand yeah definitely and i think being late to the game um you know, the, a lot of the culture in, in Phoenix for years was California or Denver beers. Right. And it's only been the last 10 years where, uh, you know, outside some of the original people like Four Peaks and Santan and, and uh, those kind of places, um, you know, it's, it's been uh, seeing the growth of the brewers and breweries along with the consumers and getting them um, really excited and interested in, in, in what Phoenix can do. It was funny. I, I used to uh, go down to the Tucson Gem and Mineral shows every year, and I remember seeking out seventeen hundred something. There was some beer bar in Tucson that was you know, Pete's place with it, and it's like, oh, 
you know, this is the best, one of the best craft beer bars in Tucson. And I look at the, they have this fridge behind the bar and the sign over it said, your Colorado craft beer headquarters. Yeah. <laughs> and I like, I came here from Colorado and I don't want any Colorado craft exactly. beer, but that was, that was a selling point that we've got the Colorado craft beer. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And you know, I mean, it's because they had great craft beer in, in Phoenix, you know, for, for being behind the times, um, for a city our size, um, I think what's happened in the last 10 years has been awesome. The amount of high quality breweries, um, and that's all supported by the consumers here in Arizona who are really educated and really passionate and, and they know beer as well as anyone. And, uh, it's afforded the opportunity for a lot of breweries such as Ren House to be able to do what they do. Cool. Cool. So you, you all start up Ren House, mm -hmm. um, and you're starting with a blank slate. And you're there from, you know, that, that very first, you know, creative step. How do you decide what rent house is going to be? Man, that uh, was a long time ago. Let me think. Well, you know, and of course these things change and evolve over time. Totally. But I always love tracking that kind of process. Like, what did we intend to be and what did we become? How yeah. did those things align? And what were those steps of development that happened along that way? I'm totally biased on this just because I love that creative side yeah. of it. Uh, you know, but you identify like, you know, you, you want to make beer, but you also need to become a brand that people relate to something. And so there has to be usually some idea behind that brand. Um, how did you all develop that? And what, what was the, what was the mission when you started? Yeah. One of the things, um, that we did was, you know, which I suppose in hindsight worked out well is, there was already some very good breweries in town and, and there's, you know, even more now, but we saw there were some areas that we really uh, thought could be expanded in the market here in Arizona. And at the time, so 10, nine, 10 years ago, uh, we saw lagers and barrel aged beers being, you know, under produced in the state. Um, so from inception, the technically the first beer we ever brewed here was a lager. Um, it was a really small batch that I could start propping up uh, enough yeast for a full-size batch because we uh, didn't have the money for a 20-barrel <laughs> pitch at the time. Oh, um, yeah. But um, so we, you know, the the first uh, mash we ever did here was was a one-barrel lager mash in order to start building up a, a lager strain. Um, and then we brewed uh, Black Caddis, our first beer to be packaged, which is still on draft today. Um and then we brewed. And that's a porter? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, we, am I wrong? Is no, something you're not. Else? I'm trying okay. to think of what we call it now, but <laughs> uh, technically we, it's a lager, but we market oh. it as a porter. It's kind of like a session Baltic porter. So huh. it's, it's just a. Uh, What's the ABV? We, we've been moving that around a little bit, but oh. it's, it's in the fours oh, usually okay. yeah, yeah. To, to low fives. Um, and uh, it's, it, that one's so the, it's technically a black lager that you yeah. sell as a porter. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, a hybrid style for us, yeah. but, but the, nothing uh, wrong with that. I'm just fascinated by it. Yeah. It, it gets a little confusing and we had a meeting about it today on, on what the best direction is, but we found that, um, lagering that gives, um, the best, uh, characteristic that we're going for which is a very sessionable but very dark and roasty beer and so we find that that lagering was the only way we could execute that huh um but uh i will circle back to that later yeah, on well, we can get like into a that. great topic to talk about but uh and then from inception we brewed a, a kind of a double triple version of that same beer which is called who hit john um and put that into barrels right out the gate so that within six nine also with lager yeast no oh, that, okay. that one was not okay yeah. Good question, though. <laughs> Someone, uh, one of our brewers misunderstood that story and did do it with lager yeast. So uh, it did not work. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so we we saw, you know, that uh, lagers are great and um, and uh, super drinkable. And, and, you know, 10 years ago, they might not sell very well, but it's something that we always wanted in our portfolio. Um, and now we're fortunate enough that the consumers kind of across the country have kind of moved in that direction enough. Right. Uh, to allow us to brew more lagers, which is really nice. It's something we like to do. And like I said at the top, you've now launched an entire beer hall, uh, you know, focused on, uh, you know, a lineup of lagers, which mm -hmm. is certainly a cool expression of that. Well, you know, I want to, th then how, uh, you know, where did Hazy IPA figure into this whole piece? Because then that became, uh, uh, you know, as that started developing right around, uh, you know, a few short years after you all, as you all were getting started. 
that 2014, 15, 16 kind of realm was yeah. the, the, the high point of growth for it. And then, you know, by what, 2019, it was a category in GABF? Crazy. Yeah. 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 I mean, I wish, I wish I could say I saw that coming. I, uh, I think I'm on record saying that the fad will never last and I didn't want to brew a hazy IPA. <laughs> um, but you know, at least you're willing to admit that now. Yeah, no, Drew and our, in our brewer, our other brewer at the time, um, kind of, uh, kept pushing and, and we started experimenting and, um, there wasn't as much literature at the time. So it was a lot of trial and error to get what we wanted. And, um, Spellbinder ended up being the first one, um, that, you know, kind of, expressed in the way we we had hoped um and so that's the one we started building off of improving over the years um and um you know but it, it took some work to get there i mean the early days of, of craft breweries trying to you know replicate these really exciting and unique beers um that you know as a startup they're extremely expensive to make to the amount of you know hot matter that goes into those um can be debilitating if they don't sell i mean there's a mutual it's a lot of beer to dump down a lot of a lot of ingredients uh, yeah. that you've invested into and it's a, a mutual kind of contract um with the guests here that like we make it good enough that they're willing to pay that you know premium back then um you know when 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 they were new to the market they they didn't fit into a price point that the normal person was was spending at the time um, but it was a leap of faith for craft breweries around the country and and uh, I think the the product that came out of it uh, justified, you know, those. Still cheaper than trying to trade with somebody from the from New England yeah. to, to ship uh, cans of Treehouse or Trillium right. down yeah. to you. Uh, remember those days. Anyway, well, you know, I want to like dive in deeper into some of the process, you know, creative process, and of course, brewing process. And uh, Black Cata sounds like a great place to start. Before we do that, streamline efficiency with Omega Yeast Diacetyl Knockout Series. The DKO series is comprised of eight familiar yeast strains engineered to knock out the formation of diacetyl before it starts. The strains you know now better. Available now for made-to-order pitchables at any volume. Contact Omega Yeast today at omegayeast.com. Also, ABS Commercial has been a full-service brewery outfitter for over 10 years. They're proud to offer brew houses, tanks, keg washers, and preventative maintenance parts to brewers across the country, as well as equipment for distilling, cider making, wine making, and more. They know the ins and outs of the brewing and installation process and can design the perfect setup for you, whether you're just starting out or looking to expand. Contact them today at sales at abs-commercial.com to discuss your customized brewery needs. ABS Commercial, we are brewers. And are you planning a brewery considering the purchase of an existing brewery or are you working in, an, in the industry and kicking around the idea of realizing your own brewery vision? If any of these apply, go to breweryworkshop.com right now. Check out our upcoming Brewery Accelerator March 24th through 27th in Austin, Texas. Some of our favorite award-winning brewers are joining us to help share the knowledge you need like Marcus Baskerville of Weathered Souls, Joe Morfell of the Pint House, and Neil Fisher of Weldworks, who's coming all the way down from Colorado for that. This will be the only Brewery Accelerator event in 2024, so don't wait. Of course, I'll be there moderating panels, uh, meeting with folks, and uh, sharing any insight that I can. Don't wait. Secure your spot now at breweryworkshop.com, and uh, I think we only have two or three tickets available. As, as of this recording, uh, it may actually be sold out by the time this goes. And if it is, uh, then sign up for our, uh, our wait list for that event or pay attention for next year's event. All right, Preston, let's talk about Black Caddis. I'm curious about this. So you design a, a sessionable black beer, uh, dark beer that you want to have roasty and flavorful, but also 4% drinkable, um, multiple pints, um, you know, what was, uh, what was the process that went into that? And then how did you decide how to actually build a recipe and a process around making that beer? Yeah. So that's the one, uh, that was the first homebrew I ever did. Um, I met with the good people at Brewers Connection, the local homebrew store. This was 15, 20 years ago, whatever. But, um, and, uh, I'd kind of explained to them what I wanted conceptually and, and so it started off, they said, well, you know, it kind of sounds like, you know, a really dark alt beer. So let's, let's use that. And, and we would do some different fermentation techniques, um, to make that happen. And, and I the, like that it started as an idea for flavor yeah. and something that you wanted to drink and didn't start as defined by a particular style. Yeah. I think, you know, and I don't know, there's probably smarter people than me who've, who've looked into this or, or thought more about it, but you know, 
Phoenix for a long time, you know, was, you know, either behind or ahead of the times with, uh, with, with loggers. Um, and part of that's genuinely because it's 122 degrees out during the fun months, right? Like you need to have something that's sessionable. Um, and, uh, you know, for, for a lot of the time. And so, you know, drinkability can be huge in a market where the summers are genuinely that warm. Um, and you know, there's braver souls that can drink those hazy doubles year round, but there's people like me who are a little more weak, uh, who need something lighter. And, but I wanted that flavor that people love, uh, from a porter, um, in something equally sessionable. Um, so the target's always high fours to low fives, right around 5.0. Um, and then, you know, um, but you can only manipulate so much on the grain bill. Um, and we found that um, the fermentation is where that happens. So back to its roots of it being a Kolsch, we do, um, we did that for a while with ale yeast uh, and just ferment a little bit cooler. Um, and we really liked that. And then one time we, we decided, let's just try it with some uh, lager yeast um, and then treat it like a lager. Um, and we were very happy with it. And it's been that way for a couple of years. So we still, you know, market it and talk about it like a porter um, because that is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in in practice, it's it's a porter. It's meant to, to be a porter. Um, but the way we were able to Porter explains the expectation to a consumer exactly. as they're drinking it. Th that's yeah. exactly right. Which is yeah. whether if, it's connected to the technical processes that make it or not, I, yeah. you know, and I'm probably breaking some unwritten rule by, by doing that, but that's how we were able to get a drinkable porter is, is with that, that cool fermentation. It's a cold porter. I look at that. We, <laughs> yeah. you, oh, a cold porter. Man, that, <laughs> that's even a killer name know, too. Right? <laughs> Although I'm sure Cole Porter has uh, tra tra trademarked the family uh, will will probably come after you if anyone who uses anything that sounds close to it. Anyway, um, no, I'm you know, but it's interesting to think about beer that way. Again, we get so locked into stylistic silos and thinking about them in this very specific framework. And when you think about them in that different kind of framework, what am I trying to accomplish flavor wise, and how do I build a series of techniques? You know, you know, th through a brew house and a cellar in order to accomplish that and it can be done in multiple ways and some of those ways cross these lines between that we these imaginary lines that we've now built mm -hmm. between ale and lager i mean that's uh it's actually kind of cool to you know to look at it that way yeah yeah so what's the you know can we talk about uh, how you built this recipe and uh you know how the other ingredients feed into this because again building that kind of roasty character and uh um you know that feeling of body while it's still light um that can handle heavy roast character and making sure that that roast character is nice and pleasant and not astringent and that, uh, you know, it has just that perfect amount of sweetness to help soften the edges of that, uh, those potentially sharper flavors. I mean, all of these are even harder to accomplish in a four to 5% beer. Uh, how do you, how'd you go about doing it? We're rewarded by the fact that we've been brewing that for nine years now. Sure. Sure. And so, from batch to batch, there could be these really subtle changes um, that might not be perceptible. But it, you know, it'd be fascinating to try batch one to batch two hundred. They might not taste anything alike. Um, so you know, it, for the most part, though, we've kept the grain the same. Where's it? Where's it now then? And you should do that. I mean, I loved it. Uh, you know, I love like Russian River Blue brewed their 1993 Blind Pig, right? And mm -hmm. they went back to the original brew, uh, brew logs oh, that's and right, built yeah. that. And like, and it is a very different beer than Blind Pig is totally. But it's a but it's absolutely amazing to watch. You know, the brand has just shifted slowly over time and become, but it stayed what people expect from it, even if that's a very different recipe. Now, um, we don't need to go in that whole evolution of Black Caddis, but what is it? What's it look like now? I'm curious. Um, you know, it's, it's mostly Weyermann malt, um, yeah. which, which it's, it's, it always was, uh, for the specialty malts and in the backbone of that, that we think gives it a lot of its characters, the chocolate rye. Um, and that's been the case since batch one homebrew 15 years ago. Mm. Um, that chocolate rye is just a really exciting, uh, I, I love the spiciness and the roastiness of it. Um, so anytime we find a good home for that malt, we put it in the beer. Oh um, yeah. I just love it. Um, and um, so that's kind of the backbone. You design new recipes knowing I could use How chocolate rye. How can I use rye more this? chocolate rye? Yeah. Um, but, and then some other. Just uh, standard two row base malts or? Uh, we are, this last batch we experimented with Weyermann, um Pilsner oh. malt. 
Um, Pilsner malts. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and why? Y- it's not like, uh, you know, when I ask why you're using Pilsner malts in your IPA, I know exactly why, because yeah. I'm trying to get that lightest color possible. Yeah. Here, you're definitely not concerned about the lightest color possible. Yeah. You know, um, so the reason is, and this might be inside baseball a little bit, but um, we have a silo at our production facility. Sure. And the silo, you can only pick one thing. And right, so right. for the last couple of years, it's been Pilsner malt, um, a, a, a bulk uh, base malt, yeah, Pilsner. Yeah. And, um, and the reason was we do you know a lot of lagers and a lot of IPAs. And uh, we thought a two-row might hinder our lagers. Um, and we thought like a really European lager malt might hinder our IPA. So we found something in between, like a Canadian Pilsner malt. And then what happened was um, a lot of our recipes got redesigned to use this Pilsner malt. Um, and then we realized as uh, the growth in the, the lager um, scene continued, um, we started ordering more specialty base malts for our Euro lagers, whether that's Bohemian or um, Barca or any of these really uh, fun, expressive uh, base malts, we realized we weren't really using the silo for our lagers anymore. And so all we were doing was buying it because we had been buying it. Um, And so we switched back to a a really nice two row. And then, um, you know, a couple of the recipes stayed Pilsner because of that, though. And Black Caddis, we thought, was best during its Pilsner days. So we never went back to a two row. And so then you just buy it in uh, in bags or uh, super sacks yeah. or something. Yeah, we get a shipping container. Yeah, straight from Germany. Fair, yeah. fair. So what what was it about uh, the Pilsner malt that uh, that was so appealing when you could now lean on the silo si- of uh, two row? Um, what made you want to to keep it there? Like from a sensory perspective, you know, was it just uh, you know this lighter and brighter yeah. expression or definitely? Um, you know, it uh, it had. It, it, it just had that really nice uh, clean cutting characteristic um, that played into the uh, roastiness and chocolatiness of the other malts. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And, cool. And I reserve the right to change that opinion and <laughs> next time I brew it. <laughs> All right. Nothing is set. Every, uh, <laughs> you just need to put a little warning label on this podcast <laughs> episode. Uh, All opinions subject to change. <laughs> Oh, but that's fair. At least, you know, all of these are dynamic processes and, uh, you know, yeah. So, so where do you go from there? You know, chocolate rye, you know, is this other big piece in addition to the Pilsner malt? Are there any mm-hmm. other, um, you know, especially malts that you particularly love and, and lean on in here and what kind of rough percentages, uh, are we talking about for some of these specialties? Um, yeah, I mean, carafe as much chocolate rye as you can get in. <laughs> We've tried that. That doesn't work. No. There's a point of diminishing returns. Uh, but, um, no, it's it's about eighty five percent base malt, yeah. and then and then the rest is split up relatively equally with carafa and one twenty and uh, carafoam um, for a little you know sweetness, and then uh, and the cho- chocolate rye. Yeah, but at least a few little layers of uh, of different malts there. That, yeah, definitely. Uh, that kind of build some some extra mid tones and. Yep. So you're you're bridging over with uh, you know, with some of those, so you're not going straight into the your chocolate rye. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. Is there anything to the way that, uh, you know, that you then mash the beer? I mean, I imagine it started as a homebrew and then, you know, way you brew it, have brewed it here at the small little system out back behind the yep. Phoenix tap room uh, is going to be different than maybe the way you brew it at the production brewery in uh, Prescott. And, uh, yeah, we, we pretty much brew this one all down here. Okay. Um, these days. Um, and, uh, no, that, that one has, a. A pretty standard mash to it. Um, Single infusion mash. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anything else to the the brewing process then on the hot side? Uh, you know, how do you do you hop this uh, much on the hop side? No. Uh, it's uh, uh, there's a, a few different um, additions throughout it, uh, but pretty low. Um, yeah. Uh, and and enough that uh, you know it complements the malt, but we we don't want it to be a hop forward beer. Yeah. And then uh, you said you know it's it's a it's a lager fermentation. So uh, what do you have a house lager strain that uh, you know that you now can propagate enough across uh, yeah. all your lagers to use on this one? <laughs> well, we've backed ourselves in a corner. We we use a few different strains at all times. So, um, um, but a lot of these we use effectively. Now you can afford to order pitches, though. Well, <laughs> yeah, the uh, 
the uh, that's the case with a lot of our Euro loggers. Some of these ones will use effectively thirty four seventy. Yeah. Um, whether that's bricks or pitch, um, um, but there it's a nice, consistent, clean, uh, straight from Gen One yeast that that we've found reliable over the years. Yeah. So this is just a thirty four seventy bl- uh, porter with uh, yeah yeah cool. Anything else to the way that you uh, you finish it or uh, you know bring it to a close? Or are there any other elements that uh, you found truly make a difference between it working so well at that kind of uh, you know low ABV but flavorful realm? Um, you know anything that gives it that nice uh, you know clean finish? No, I mean you know we the seller side um, definitely is is what can stand it apart from you know the early days to now is. Um, is um, really paying attention to the numbers uh, when it's in tank, yeah, uh, and keeping it healthy and keeping it where you want it, and and treating it, um, in in treating it the, the way it, it needs to be um, with that lager yeast, um, and watching those temperatures and pH spikes and things, um, and um, yeah, just baby it. Um, we we are able to finish it quicker than we would um, a lot of our other lagers um, um, because it has that complexity in the grain bill, um, but. You know, we're, it's, it's always a fun one. It's, it's since day one, it's, it's been, um, kind of an in-house favorite from the team. Um, and there's different times where like it, it gets threatened to be taken off the, uh, the core list and then times where it comes back with a fury. Um, and right now, you know, people are really enjoying it. Um, it does well in the winter, does well in the summer. You can always grab a can of it. Um, so we'll see. You mentioned earlier that uh, you're able to get it to where you want it to be flavor wise with this lagering, you know, so two questions then, you know, how long does that lagering last? You mentioned it's not as long as some of your other lagers. And then the, the follow up on that is what effect is that lagering giving the beer that when you did brew it with ale yeast or the in a kind of hybrid approach or with the coal yeast, as you mentioned, that it might not have been quite uh, as defined. What were some of the, you know, so what's that lagering time? And then what are the sensory differences uh, when you were not brewing it with lager yeast and lagering it like that? It's hard to answer that without it being totally anecdotal. Um, I, I'm you, okay. I'm here <laughs> for anecdotes, though. You know, we're, this is all subjective. We're talking about brewing. Yeah, the... You know, I wish I had a spreadsheet where I could look at the, you know, some of these quantitatively. But but in general, you know, so we'll go three to four weeks um, from grain to glass on this, which is two weeks longer than most of our ales. Um, and, uh, you know, and sometimes it go long, sometimes it'll go short, depending on what generation yeast it is and, and what we're seeing from a, a, a profile perspective from what the yeast is doing. But to answer your question, um, the, you know, the... We just see a lot more gentler fermentation, um, so very low ester p- produced, and from that, you know, we we are able to let the the grain bill shine a little bit more, um, and um, you know, like I said, anecdotally, that's that's where we're at right now. Uh, we we found a, a nice kind of a, a position where we we like that beer. I'm curious, like, you know, because if I think about Kolsch yeast and the kind of, you know, like, uh, you know, pear or, uh, you know, esters, like some of those are very particular esters that, uh, you know, I could see, you know, them wrestling a little bit with mm-hmm. some of that character. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so to be able to inhibit that and, you know, it has a, a more complex and robust grain build than, than most loggers or hybrids sure. or, you know, whatever. So it, it uh, I don't know if it masks um, some of that, um, and maybe that, that threshold is just minimized by the lager yeast. Yeah. Um, anything that you do particularly to, you know, have smooth the edge on that, because, you know, again, you're talking about a pretty light lager or light beer here. Um, that's got some pretty strong roast character, mm-hmm. you know, getting that roast character to be just right and smooth without being astringent or ashy, um, you know, and a beer that small is his own particular challenge. Yeah. Again, this, when you brew it that many times, it's a lot of microscopic changes sure, sure, over the sure. years um, to hit the numbers we have. And then, you know, the good part with that is we can use that information uh, to predicate how we treat a similar style beer down the road. Right. Um, and so it's a good it's a good uh, set, uh, base point for a lot of this stuff. Um, but, you know, 
we definitely a lot of these beers, especially these more uh, experimental, at least from conception, um, is is trial and error and yeah. sm- and lots of small changes. Anything to the water on this one? We've been uh, experimenting with that more yeah. than ever lately. Um, but I would say water chemistry Arizona does huge. not necessarily have the greatest water. Uh, my no. hotel water is like, it's salty. <laughs> I, I mean, I literally can sense the salt in it, but, uh, the, um, yeah, I mean, Phoenix is tough. Um, we also have a few different water sources depending on right. the time of year and, and all these different, um, issues, um, from that standpoint. Um, but w- we get around, we RO everything. Sure, so sure. we're building up from the ground. But right. um, yeah, I mean, it's it's all the salts you would expect. And we're just trying to hit uh, a profile that works well for that beer. Um, and that's something we were talking about earlier today, uh, specific to that beer, hmm. um, is some of the improvements we've seen. But, um, you know, I'd be hesitant to uh, guarantee those because, again, I reserve the right to change my opinion. <laughs> but uh, we, we found a really uh, nice uh, uh, ratio of all if of our If you don't tell me now, Preston, then we, we won't need to revisit this in you know four or five years once you've changed everything just to go back over it all again. So, you know, <laughs> well, we got to catch you on the record for something here. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's going to be... Um, th- we use a little bit of Epsom and calcium chloride yeah. in that. Um, and then... Um, you know, we have to do pH adjustments throughout, um, and, and that right. changes uh, batch to batch. So we're, we're live monitoring to that. Um, we do um, constant pH tests during um, during our mash and during our louder, hmm. during our, I mean, at all stages, so that we can make sure uh, we know where we're at uh, from the pH perspective on a beer like this specifically. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't always mean we're adjusting each time we take it, but if we know which direction it's heading, um, it affords us the opportunity to, um, to, to either make changes real time or, or to do preventative steps right. to get there. Right. And if that's changing your mash temp or, you know, when you're mashing in, um, are you going to add some of those salts at that point? Uh, a lot of these things, um, we're able to, um, get ahead of uh by that constant uh monitoring um and so that one will have a lot of different really small um additions throughout the mash and transfer uh to the kettle um in order to to hit those numbers how tight is your tolerance then for for ph if you're talking about making small adjustments all the way along you must have a pretty tight sop on uh on some of that yeah it's uh it, it kind of depends if, it, if it's a one-off beer. Yeah. Um, we'll have tight. Um, and uh, so, or, you know, from the other perspective, if it's if it's an experimental one-off beer, um, we might just let it go and see what happens. Um, because yeah. if we start adjusting that, we won't know if it's the recipe or the water or, you know. Right. Um, we're, we're all about um, kind of the analytical way of, of approaching some of these things. Um and so being able to change one variable at a time is really big to me. Sure. Um, and so, you know, it depends on it. But if if it's uh, something we've brewed before and we're not in that zone instinctively, I would say something's going wrong. Yeah. And, and we need to, you know, figure out immediately what's happening. But other than that, yeah, it might just be knocking down um, with a few milliliters of, of lactic acid sure. or, or uh, bumping it up with uh, – Uh, baking soda or something like that sure sure well let's shift some gears and and talk a little bit about hazy ipa just uh just because we can't not talk about it like kind of have to you know um and uh you know before we do that uh, ss brew tech was founded by a group of home and craft beer brewers dedicated to bringing an engineering first approach to brewery equipment ss brew houses are used to formulate new beer recipes at some of the world's greatest breweries under the cornerstone of many local breweries. To learn more about SS Brewtech's innovation list, head on over to ssbrewtech.com. Also, some brewers want their water profile to be that of their city, and that sounds great, except for one factor. Depending upon the city and the day, the water quality can vary 40 to 50%. So a Monday brew can taste very different from a Thursday brew. Savvy brewers know this since beer is like 95% water. The best method is to start with the same water every time and reverse osmosis gives you that power. Visit uswatersystems.com for a free 
expert analysis. I swear I didn't bring the water subject up there. Just, uh, I was, yeah, <laughs> it was totally organic, totally organic. But, uh, uh, but let's talk about hazy IPA and, uh, you know, maybe we can talk about it in, you know, in terms of spellbinder, but also, you know, the spellbinder, um, you know, what, what you're brewing now. And, uh, you know, of course, spellbinder is still a big, uh, core brand for you. Um, you know, but what is, what's your hazy IPA program look like now? And, uh, where are you at in terms of, how you found you like making hazy IPA, single IPAs or double IPAs right now at this moment, anecdotally in a way that does not need to represent how you will brew it a year from now and doesn't represent how you might've brewed it three years ago or four years ago when you won a medal for it. Just how, just now, just this moment of time snapshot. See, I'm, I'm not, yeah, give, I'm not giving you an out. I'm not giving you an out. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we love uh, brewing hazy IPAs and, um, the, the expression of a hazy IPA is unlike anything else. Um, um, and, you know, that's something, um, you know, that we've found over the years is, is that as these, these, you know, and part of that's the, as these hop growers are coming out with these really exciting, whether it's New Zealand hops or wildly expressive American hops, you know, the, they, uh, they, they can stand out on a way that they never did before with these huge, you know, dry hop punches and, uh, and, and all of these really fun, uh, expressive mechanisms through the, uh, the hazy IPAs allow them to do. And because of that, you know, you're able to, um, um, create these beers that on base level are very similar, but in the, in the final expression of them, when, how much, what variety of hops you used, you have a completely different beer that, um, you know, is a something for an entirely different group of people. You know, they, they might love these ones. Like, you know, there's people who like you put Nelson in a beer, they're there day one. I'm there. And there's people who like will not come in if they hear there's Nelson in it, you know, and and that's something unique to that style, which is it makes the hop such the backbone of that in a way that even probably, um, I mean, old school traditional IPAs didn't have. Um, and, you know, that's something really exciting about these new um, clear, bright, pale um, IPAs are allowing that same opportunity. And so I think, you know, that that's really exciting as well. It's interesting that it hinges so much on single ingredient yeah. like that. And that uh, even more than the style, that it's the For single sure. ingredient. Yeah. But it also reflects like how even now in the kind of competitive sense, the the major beer competitions and GABF World Beer Cup will mention, you know, a uh, uh, international, uh, you know, or a, uh, Australian or New Zealand mm -hmm. IPA. Like you have a whole other category totally yeah you know for that and it, it tries to describe via origin which i don't know is necessarily the best way to do it um versus flavor um because if you look at who has won in some of those categories they've uh they've won with american hops in yeah, their totally. beers and so it doesn't always like uh align that way you, you know you can achieve some of these flavors um using you know different uh, hops to get there but um you know for you guys what is uh, are there a few main buckets that you then put these into that uh that you explore within and then um and we can talk about hops for a little bit but then i'll go back and talk about uh how you build a, a base and support for some of these strong hot flavors yeah you know the the other thing we found in that vein is that um finding like a series um, so multiple, uh, beers with the same base, um, can lead to that expression of hop in a way, um, that that's a lot more approachable from a, uh, drinker's perspective, which is, so like Spellbinder, you know, we try and keep it super consistent. We're really proud of that beer. Um, and, and we love the hops, but at the, at the end of the day, it is another mosaic citra hop, hopped, uh, hazy IPA. And we think it stands apart and all that. And we're very proud of that beer. But um, what we've started doing is doing like a New Zealand Spellbinder. So Spellbinder in concept and in execution all the way up to the dry hop. And then we just hit it with, you know, these really special New Zealand hops um, from Eggers Farms or New Zealand uh, or from uh, Freestyle. And, uh, you know, that, that allows us to have that same character that people are comfortable with and have associated with for years and then give it a new twist. Um, and so that's something that's been really exciting for us. And it's something we also do with our uh, clear IPAs as well. Makes sense to build on a brand that people already yeah. uh, respect, you know, also. It, sure. And it affords us the opportunity to experiment too. You yeah. Know? 
And the big fear is, what if it's better than Spellbinder? What do we do? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. What are the odds yeah. <laughs> of any any of these variations ultimately replacing a Citra Mosaic AZ IPA? Probably zero. Probably zero. <laughs> yeah, I think you can take those risks. Um, not to say that somebody's not going to find one version that they love even more, or that yeah. you know, if you bump up a uh, you know a little bit of sweetness and triple dry hop it, and somebody's looking for that kind of intensity, that that they're going to find a definitely. Very Variation yeah. that they truly, really love even more than the baseline, but you know, you always come back to that baseline too. Sure. Well, what is what did you know? What what becomes your baseline then? Uh, you know, for these, how how do you build a a structure that can support all of these you know big hop flavors? Because you know, in terms of mouthfeel, people have that expectation. You hear in this, as you mentioned, hot environment in Arizona where it's 120 degrees in the summertime. Also need to build drinkability into it, and uh, and I suspect that that balance of drinkability and pillowy texture is probably one of the reasons why you did as well as you you did in that kind of competition realm. Since uh, brewers judging that competition always really also value the drinkability piece in addition to uh, to that kind of big pillowy mouthfeel. How how do you all uh, you know what? Um, structurally, you know, how do you design a beer that can, uh, that can withstand all of that or hit these two competing, right. uh, goals that are both important in their own ways? You know, the, I mean, the recipes out there, you guys have published it. Yes. And it was a huge honor for us to, to have that. So thank you. Go to beerandbring.com, Click on that subscribe button. If you're not a subscriber yet. Absolutely. And, and we may re-update if there's any new changes, since obviously none of your recipes stay the same for very long. <laughs> and that's now four years old. Minor so. tweaks. Okay. I, I okay. promise. Um, but the grain bill, you know, is going to be the same with that uh, uh, malt and oat uh, at about 25% um, and then 75% base malt. Um, but, you know, to, to really get that drinkability, we found that very low levels of hot side hops um, and Hmm. We kept cutting it back, cutting it back until, you know, we're at about one pound per barrel. Um, and that doesn't hit. All in the Whirlpool? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All in the Whirlpool um, after we've knocked it down some degrees. Um, and, you know, we found that. It, How much you knock it down? We try and hit around 185. Okay. Um, and It's cool pool, but it's not that cool. Yeah. You know, and, and that's something we... Uh, it's hard to cool things down here in Arizona, too, it's <laughs> that much. <laughs> yeah, that's our tap water, 185. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so, you know, we found that, you know, letting the dry hop, you know, at the end of the day, that's going to be w what's giving it that character anyways. Yeah. So to really rely on that for that beer. And that might be, you know, the change. If I looked back at the, the recipe we sent you, um, even then we probably were a little bit higher than that. Um, and, you know, as we've pulled it back, we found that was a good level, both for haze stability hmm. and, you know, you still want some of that hot bite, but uh, it's not that, you know, sharp bitterness that you'd get if we added it at 15, 30, 60. So if it's about one pound hot side, you know, in the whirlpool, you know, what is that in percentage of overall hops in a, you know, a, a hazy IPA? Yeah, so Spellbinder. Are you at three or four or five pounds per barrel on that, and one pound of that is in the on the hot side? Yeah, so you can make do math on oh, top of my head. Math. I'm trying to think of how many on boxes we put in. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's about four pounds per barrel total, okay. so it yeah. would be three pounds in the okay. fermenter. Yeah, yeah, and that's a very significant weighting onto the cold side yeah. for hops there. Yeah, no, definitely, but... Um, you know, finding that ratio of citra to mosaic. And then we also do add uh, galaxy and cascade as well um, at lower levels. Um, again, for hay stability and that complexity um, that melds those two together. Um, citra and mosaic, mosaic historically play great together, um, but you always need something to kind of bridge that gap we found. Oh, really? And uh, so that's what we uh, tend to do with that beer. And galaxy is very haze positive in that sense, you know. Um, but you say to find the right balance between citra and mosaic. What uh, what is that balance? You're not just at a fifty fifty balance between the two of them. The citra mosaic, um, in the dry hop would be about fifty fifty. Okay. Um, and uh, and then um, yeah, yeah. On the hot side though. On the hot side, we're doing um, cascade. Cascade. Yeah. Give it a little bit of that classic feel. Yeah. 
So the whirlpool is is ca- cascade in the whirlpool. Mm-hmm. Cascade. I'm so bad at remembering these things off the top of my head. <laughs> cascade. Uh, you know, we do uh, 11 pounds cascade mosaic in Galaxy. Oh, okay. That's right. And so the Citra is all uh, in the dry hop. Huh. And, and we found that uh, we weren't at that level. Um, the, the Citra just... It wasn't doing justice to that hop to be sure, adding it that sure. level. And we found that the, the other combination um, was successful. It's a survival didn't survive as yeah, much, uh, was, even there in the whirlpool. Huh? You know, and, and uh, brewers will understand this. It might, it might be uh, superstitious at a su- certain point, but you find a batch that works perfectly, and, and, and you love that one until the next time you find one that's more perfecter. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, though, that I, and I love that, you know, Cascade and, and like, you are – spanning this hop spectrum from you know classic american hop sea hop like cascade which definitely adds this kind of rooted uh you know american hop character to it to then you know modern new school american hops and that you know in, in citra and mosaic but then also you know super new school australian galaxy um you know and so it truly becomes this this kind of uh, mix of hops that's spanning time generations of brewers as well as uh um, you know, obviously the Pacific Ocean and, and hot yeah. variety too. Yeah, and you know, like like I said earlier, the the ability to brew things multiple times affords you that opportunity to find what works for you with your system and your palate. But we brew that we brew uh, a double batch every week. Yeah, and so we're turning that beer a lot. So you know, we are afforded that opportunity. You get to learn things about it every week. Yeah, <laughs> every week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what is it? What is it about the the galaxy? I mean, I, I obviously, you know, having some of that positive impact on haze stability matters. But yeah. uh, um, is that uh, is it primarily that kind of functional piece for the galaxy? Is there a flavor contribution, aroma contribution as well? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. It's a little bit of everything, um, and um, but you know, we really like you know that. N- kind of new age character that it gives off this this really you know tropical tank whatever um but we found that we've had most success with it as this this um bridge between other hops Hmm. um and so a lot of times not always but depending on the beer um we really like how it tastes um we prefer it as a a small or mid-sized percentage of a dry hop than entirely on its own or as the predominant hmm. hop in a dry hop um it can it can throw off some some flavors that that uh we we find astringent or you know too much of a good thing and and we found that that low levels uh you know the haze like we talked about but also just this character this complexity that bridges that gap uh it is has been something that we can pick up on and that that we really appreciate without becoming that kind of Nelson thing where a right. certain crowd is going to be like, I can't, I'm not going to totally. even try drinking yeah. that. You don't even really need to know that galaxy is in there. It's just yeah. doing its little thing. Yeah. It's just the glue kind of holding it together for us. Um, and um, yeah, we've been, we've been happy with that change. Sure. Is there anything to the, the way that you dry hop that? Yeah. You know, is it just a pretty standard dry hop uh, process uh, in terms of temperature and time? You know, are there any, recirculation or is there any uh any techniques that you use because you're also i mean these are these are all expensive hops and you're using mm-hmm. a bunch of them uh you know what do you do to get get really good clean expressive results out of the dry hops yeah that's something we've probably spent more time talking about and working on than any other aspect of that beer in our hazies in general um and you know we we'll talk to some friends from from Colorado and then San Diego and Washington and they all have their theories and they're all completely different and then I have a small panic attack and I I just want this unifying agreement on how to do it and there isn't one and we right now are uh in for the last couple of years have done a very early dry hop um and then we uh essentially spund it we'll cap it a little bit early and, and let it um carbonate they naturally. say early you mean like while well, if there's still active fermentation happening. oh yeah, yeah for sure how early in that it has are we talking like day one two of fermentation or are we talking like day about three three okay 
Um, it, it depends on, on the beer, but for Spellbinder, we're right around there. Um, and then, um, you know, if we need, and, and then we'll, we'll do some bursts as well. So CO2 from the bottom and, right. and kick up that hop um, material, make sure that it's flowing well. But because it's during active fermentation, we see a lot of that mixing in tank. Um, and then... Um, but and it doesn't impact taste stability, you know, even if you're throwing it in at that point. I mean, obviously there's you know, that some of the research out now, like that why a lot of people are pushing more into the hot side, like, so there's not hop matter, you know, whereas if, you know, on day one, two, or, you know, if you're hopping at, uh, you know, when you're knocking out into pitching, then, uh, you know, it could negatively impact that taste stability. Or then you go to the other side and once fermentation is complete, drop yeast and then, you know, start dry hopping in order to uh, maintain that stability. But this seems like you're, you're pulling it off. It's not negatively impacting that stability. No, and you know we've we've had uh, we try and do um, turbidity tests to to see where we're at at any given time, and um, we've done a lot of trial and error to try and find what works best. Um, and you know some of our friends swear to do it, you know, drop yeast and then do it. Some some will do it day one too. Um, and again, if there's a right answer out there, we're happy to hear it. But this this has worked. Uh, there are no right <laughs> answers, but there are no wrong answers either. Well, we've done some wrong this is answers. Why, this is, well, I guess you're right. I guess you're right. This is why we have a craft beer brewing podcast totally. so that we can talk to everyone about all of the different ways that they're able to do this, knowing that uh, you know different methods will work differently for different people in different locations and all of the other parameters they have in their own brew house. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you know, it, it works for us. Um, we haven't experimented with the recirculation and part of that is, um, you know, we, we just worry that it's, it, it'll have a negative effect. Um, sure. Um, just the, the mechanical movement of that much hop. Um, so we found that uh, burst uh, works well for us. Yeah. Do you use, um, you know, concentrated hop products or flowable like cryo flowables or, or other, other things, uh, you know, in your process here? Not for Spellbinder. Yeah. Um, I would love to, I'm really happy with those products. Yeah. But, um, I'm just, I'd like to see some more, um, you know, empirical evidence on haste stability before I jump a core yeah. over to that. Right. But, but we do use it in a lot of our other hazies. Um, but, um, you know, those one-offs tend to move pretty fast and don't have, you know, the shelf life. So right. um, it's not something we've seen in them. And even with our QC, we keep them for uh, three months. We've not seen it. But I have a feeling the second I put it into our core IPA, <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. it'll change. Um, but we, we do use it. We, uh, 702 is one we really like right. from, from Yakima Chief. Um, and we were fortunate enough to, to get a medal at um, Imperial Hazy this year at JBF with that product nice um and you know it's it's one of our in-house favorites that you know of all time um blue quad roller skates um and uh we've got a batch just came out and one more batch coming out this quarter as our uh kind of end of winter seasonal um but yeah i mean freestyle we use their hop keef a lot we yeah. love that um you know we found it really successful in loggers too loggers that use a dry hop um it keeps that vegetal matter out uh, right. It gives you a lot of that. It's kind of a different characteristic than the hop itself. Um, it's still in the same family, obviously. Um, but uh, we haven't found a point where it's a direct replacement. It's more just a new product right. in the same family. But but we uh, we get a lot of both those, and we like them. And this is a London Ale 3 variant that you ferment with? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anything to the your you know, fermentation on this uh, and yeast management that you find gives you a positive results in hazy IPA? Um, we go a few generations with our IPA yeast. Mm -hmm. um, we'd like to get it up more. Just but, a few? Yeah. We go we go three to four, and then I get, okay. I get anxious and uh, kill it. But um, we, uh, you know, we, we found, uh, no, I mean, we don't have any uh, crazy advice on, on that front. Sure, um, sure. It's pretty, pretty uh, boilerplate uh, on the seller side of things. Um, but it's to us, it's a lot about monitoring, um, pH and all that. Um, and, and we found, uh, higher success with, uh, higher pH, um, beer. What do you, what do you mean by that? 
Well, I, I just think uh, hay stability, uh, just okay. maybe, a, you know, 0.1, 0.2 more than, than, than we were using uh, this time a few years ago. Where does that, where does that typically get you uh, where you finish? We're talking about like four six, four seven, four eight. Or are you pushing in those crazy four eight, four nine? No, that's right. Four five, four six, four, four five, seven. four six. Okay. Yeah. I think four six is the uh, the target for that one. Um, okay. But um, yeah, yeah, that's you're hitting the very top end of where you should be for food safety and everything else. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's zoom out here. I, you know, I, we talked about it at the, at the I, I, I teased it at the start, but because we're in award season right now, I do want to kind of talk to you about this because it is something that you do pay attention to, you do focus on, you do very specifically, you know, kind of plot out your schedule around some of the major competitions, World Beer Cup and JBF. Um, and if you're going to, you know, put in. 10 or 14 entries or whatever that is like, you know, that's an expensive investment both on the, uh, the entry side, but also on the entire brew schedule, you know, for that matter, where you are plotting these beers that you're going to make and you want to make the best versions of those beers, get them timed through the brew house in the cellar just so that they make it, uh, um, you know, talk to me about your process around that both in turn, but cause you've been successful at it. You know, you've also nabbed some medals in some pretty tough categories to win medals in. Um, you know, how do you approach brewing this kind of brewing approach to excellence, thinking about uh, competition? You know, what do you try to get out of it and how do you build, uh, you know, a program around getting great results? We probably um, get more excited about medal season or World Beer Come JBF and some of the other ones. Um, but it's it's not so much about the hardware. Like right. We genuinely look at it as th there's very few other times we get to go up against brewers you idolize, brewers you know you've respected for years, and also get this anonymous um, you know professional feedback on your product that you can then go and and um, either adjust or not adjust if you have confidence and you think you know the judge is wrong or if you maybe you're just entering the wrong category. But there's not very many times you get to do that because the other option is entirely consumer driven. And, um, you know, it's that's a scenario where, you know, you, you need to listen to these people. They're the ones that built your brewery at the end of the day. But uh, sometimes they don't give you that honest feedback. Um, and uh, sometimes they give it too hard and it hurts your feelings, which happens. But this is more like you know anonymous how many bottle caps on untapped did you get for that one <laughs> yeah, <Preston>? exactly <laughs> and so this is uh you know it's something where the the weeks months leading up to it you can sit down um and talk about um the um uh, you know the recipes and 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 um the changes you're gonna make something like black caddis where we brew it five times a year or something like that um, it doesn't get enough attention probably about like, what would we do different this year? What would we change? And, and we find it as this motivation. Um, and whether or not that's good, I don't know. Some of my best friends in the industry will never enter in JBF or World Beer Cup and not because they're above it, but for their own reasons. And that's totally fine. I respect that. And in some ways I envy them. But in other ways, it's really cool to enter this. You know, I really genuinely enjoy it. I like the competitive nature. I like putting ourselves in, in unlike a lot of things, I don't think it's us against anyone. The, the way Renhouse treats it is it's a singular thing. How good can we make this one beer? Um, and especially for those big categories, because every beer at that final table is a world-class example of that style. And so you, whether it's luck or you're a little bit better that day, or the judge is looking for this one small characteristic, the value of making that final table is something that you can use as a resource to continue to improve um, and, and see these directional changes you've made along the way to to finally see um, some sort of result. It's not something you want to you know blow up your ship over like small changes always, and um, but it is this definitive environment where you can get this feedback and be rewarded for that effort you've put into it. So what do you do differently? You know, is there anything different that you do when you're prepping these beers other than 
kind of taking stock of where each one of them are. You know, when we first opened, like we'd enter in these smaller categories and, and like, and, and we'd lose, like we didn't win for whatever, eight, uh, eight years now. So, you know, four or five years, we, we didn't win. We made a few final tables. And then I decided I'd rather lose at the big tables than lose at the small tables. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we started entering and, and there is a better upside to winning a gold medal for a hazy IPA yeah. that you can sell a lot of and then market out to uh, accounts, you know, certainly the, more so than say, you know, the field beer that you might win a gold medal for. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that that's, that's true. Um, that motivation, I don't know, you know, we, we, we sometimes will use it as a springboard to make changes that uh, otherwise would be slower to change. We're, we're always trying to improve, but we brew so many different styles and so many one-offs um, that it's hard to do that every time. Um, it would be uh, prohibitive to do it that way. So sometimes the changes are small and sometimes they're for all loggers or all IPAs. Sometimes it's just for you know these kind of loggers. And this gets us to where, what beers are we gonna enter? Okay, let's have a meeting about that one beer. Let's pull everything we can, get everyone to bring these uh, notes to the meeting. And then you can really focus on a way that, um, you know, again, we probably should be doing that with every beer we've ever released, but it, it if anything, it, it motivates us. Um, it's the occasion that drives that totally. kind of, uh, yeah. you know, that uh, reflection on, yeah. you know, and then, you know, change, may change, you know, chart a new path forward or may confirm the direction that you've been following and you just double down on what you've been doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, pulling, we save all of our, um, judging results and, and and that's the value in those and this year we went through them all for each beer we entered and and we we're able to look at trajectories and do we agree do we not agree do we want to change to meet what these two judges said last year or do we want to just keep it how it is and we tend to especially if it's a core we probably won't make those changes but it's good to see them um it's, it's sometimes hard to step back and see um so you know we find we find value in that interesting interesting um, well, we've been talking for a little while now. Maybe we'll zoom out even further and uh, and think about Ren House. You're, you know, uh, you know, at this point, what nine years, uh, you know, into this, uh, eight or nine years into to Ren House, and uh, um, how do you view Ren House? You know, in the next five years, what do you all hope to accomplish? Like you said, you started in the brewery we're in now. This uh, small very small, very cozy location with a really nice patio, um, but a pretty tight little brew house. You've got a production brew house uh, up in Prescott and you've now opened a you know, European style beer hall on the South side of Phoenix. And, uh, you know, what's next for Ren House? What do you hope to achieve? What's, uh, you know, you know, what are some of those accomplishments that you want to, you want to see over the next five years? Yeah, we've been fortunate. We got the production place a couple years ago up in Prescott and that's been, uh, you know, a godsend for us. We have an amazing team of brewers up there led by uh, Jake and Mason. Um, and so that, that's that been a really great aspect to to what we do. And then we have our um, our original location here with an equally um, well-accredited group of guys uh, from all over the country and uh, just uh, diversity of skill sets, barrel focused and, and experimental focused. And um, Matt and Nikhil and Jordan and Marcos down here and Justin um, really kill it. Um, and so to to have that as the production backbone, this, you know, two groups that work independently, but under one umbrella and communicate daily with each other in, in the growth. Um, uh, we've seen a huge, uh, you know, uh, internal growth on, on the quality and the um, consistency of our beer with the team. And so, you know, continuing that um, in, in using that diversity of, of uh of you know styles and and um, perspectives to continue to diversify our brand, um, and then find avenues to sell that. And uh, we have Sud Hall, which is a, a great restaurant, um, and um, primarily kind of European inspired beer hall down in Aotuki, South Phoenix. Um, but this year we'll be opening another one up in um, uh, Paradise Valley, um, so not far from here. And that one will have you know kind of a um, original rent house feel to it. Um, but with a lot of, you know, attention to things like casks in, in European and English style beers. Uh, and we hope that we are able to continue to do what we love, which is to have this giant 
portfolio of beers and beer genres and styles uh, that we can continue to make, whether it's barrel aged or lagers or, uh, you know, of course, the hazies and the Euro lagers. And, but, uh, you know, being able to do all of those and having a team that's passionate about every single style and never having a, you know, a question about what's next. I think, uh, I think that's really exciting. And I hope that, uh, you know, the world allows us to keep doing that peaceful coexistence of these contemporary and progressive styles as well as these all-time classics look at that i I love it they work together they're they're not competing against (laughs) each other they don't have to hate one to love the other we can love all of these things oh man that's just a it's a a beautiful big hug (laughs) well preston i think that's a great place to bring this to a close choose gnd chillers on your next expansion or brewery startup and receive one free year of remote control and monitoring pro brews engineering team prides itself on providing true customized turnkey solutions old orchard is the go-to source for fruit forward ingredients for some of the biggest names in the craft brewing landscape omega yeast's diacetyl knockout series is comprised of eight familiar yeast strains engineered to knock out the formation of diacetyl before it starts. ABS commercial are proud to offer brew houses, tanks, keg washers, and preventative maintenance parts to brewers across the country. Secure your brewery accelerator spot now at breweworkshop.com. SS Brewtech is dedicated to an engineering first approach to brewery equipment, empowers R&D at some of the world's greatest breweries, and build consistency with a reverse osmosis system from uswatersystems.com. As always, if you've enjoyed this podcast and uh, you want to read that Spellbinder uh, Hazy IPA recipe in all of its glory, go to beerandbrewing.com, click on that subscribe button, check it out online, or go uh, grab that uh, the full issue. Um, all of our back issues are available to all, all, all subscribers uh, via our app as well as our website. Um, you can go read it the way that it print, was printed in the magazine, one of the most beautiful ways to read it. Nothing against, nothing against, uh, you know, web stories, but, uh, man, I spend so much time designing these beautiful magazine pages and, uh, <laughs> I just want people to look at it that way too. I mean, we, I, we put a lot of work into making pages look good and, uh, totally. you know, there's something to it. Anyway, go to hit that subscribe button, become a subscriber to craft beer and bring press. And if people want to learn more about Ren house, where, where can they find more about you both out there in the digital space and in the real world? Yeah, I mean, renhousebrewing.com. We try and keep that up to date uh, real time um, with info about our locations, our beers. Uh, and then, of course, social media, Instagrams, uh, the way we communicate with people most often about upcoming releases, events, tap rooms, you name it. Awesome, awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you about brewing. And Thank you. Uh, been a big fan for a number of years now and it's fun to finally get down here and see it all in person and talk thanks to so you. much yeah cheers cheers this podcast has been brought to you by craft beer and brewing magazine for those who love to make and drink great beer to learn more or to subscribe visit beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craft beer brew <laughs>